Hello, everyone. This is uh, Professor Joseph on a beautiful November day, the eleventh uh, month of the great pandemic of 2020. And uh, today, I'm going to discuss another theoretical piece by Professor or Doctor David Levine, who is a political scientist and has studied extensively uh, religion, Catholicism in uh, Colombia and Venezuela. So, let me go to my notes. And here we are with my notes on the impact of liberation theology in Latin America. And I'm not set up quite right here. Let me try moving some stuff around. There, this will be better. Okay. Daniel Levine. So, he starts out by saying that uh, liberation theology in Latin America appeared as a system of ideas during a period of great social change. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, there was also a lot of ecclesiological debate. This was shortly after Vatican II in the 1960s. And this was a time of political upheaval. It's also shortly after the Cuban Revolution and the Brazilian military coup of 1964 and a number of other political developments. All this uh, was new in Latin America, not the upheaval, but the system of ideas. For centuries, religion stood as a bulwark for conservatism in this part of the world, and the Catholic Church, Church remained firmly allied with the elites opposed to change in the established order of things. And so, uh, this reminds us a little bit of Justo Gonzalez's affirmation that we need to always keep in mind the two faces of the church. The one face that's of pointing towards the uh, established elites of society and the ruling order, and the other face that's pointing towards the marginalized and the poor and the oppressed. So liberation theology was synonymous with solidarity with the poor, uh, resistance to injustice and repression, and in cases in cases otherwise as different as Brazil, Chile, or El Salvador. Um, so the article by Daniel Levine explores the origins and the key concepts of liberation theology with special concern for understanding its impact on religion, politics, and the relations among them in Latin America today. He wrote this in 1988, uh, which was uh, let me see, 1988, that was at least 20 years after the, uh, almost 20 years after the beginnings of liberation theology. So by this time, it's possible to have some perspective, not only on liberation theology itself, but the directions it might take. So according to Levine, there's some uh, important considerations. He says, careful attention needs to be paid to when and how liberation theology appeared and to the implications of the historical moment in which it appeared. In other words, it's context, and we'll develop that in a moment. The analysis must also move beyond liberation theology as a system of ideas to ask how such ideas are received and acted upon by individuals, groups, societies, and political systems. Who is the audience of liberation theology, and why do do its characteristic notions appeal and make sense to that audience. For a body of thought like liberation theology to have an impact, it must affect behavior in re regular and lasting ways. So, then he discusses the central ideas of liberation theology. Philip Berryman uh, came up with a definition that Levine quotes Number one, liberation theology is an interpretation of the Christian faith out of the suffering and hope of the poor. Uh, number two, it's a critique of society and the ideology sustaining it. And number three, 
It's also a critique of the activity of the church and Christians from the angle of the poor. Um, I uh, I like those last two because I I often emphasize with friends of mine uh, who are people of faith that it's not sufficient just to critique society and the ills of society, but we must move beyond to that to self-critique or critique of of uh, churches and Christians and our role within society. It's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So liberation theology has a preeminent concern with poverty and the poor uh, in theory and practice. Poverty is explained in structural terms, using Marxist categories of class conflict and exploitation as the basis for a critical social analysis. Consistent efforts are made to see these issues through the eyes of the poor. That's very important. Sharing their conditions and living with them in ways which undercut cultural distance between the church leadership and average believers. So some of the themes of liberation theology include a preeminent concern with history, which of course comes from, uh, is similar to Marxism. Uh, Marx was, Marxism has been called uh, dialectical materialism or also historical uh, historical dialectics or historical materialism because he does an analysis of history in stages based on class issues. It's also been a return to biblical sources. Um, I will, I'll resist the temptation to go into that a little further, but there was a uh, theological movement in the 1930s and 40s in France that uh, La Nouvelle Théologie that emphasized a return to biblical sources. Often when there's a new innovation or a new creativity in theological thinking, it has to do with going back to the sources. Stress on the emphasis of doing theology in a way which prioritizes everyday experience and the insight of average people. This is one of the strengths of Liberation theology, in my view. Uh, it also has close and complex relations with Marxist theory. And that's an avenue for which it was criticized by conservatives within the Catholic Church and even uh, caused concern for um, the U.S. government and CIA over security issues at the height of the Cold War. Um, I'm going to skip some of the detail here for the sake of time. So, liberation theology is concerned with the Bible. The first is the value of reading and commenting on biblical texts in a society whose majority was often poor and illiterate, making shared Bible study central to religious practice has a great impact. And that causes me to think of the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther's attempt to bring the scriptures to the everyday person through translating the Latin Vulgate into the German, uh, the German vernacular language and making it available to everyone through the Gutenberg printing press. And liberation theology has a similar effect of encouraging reading of scriptures analysis and the application of it to everyday life. Um, so if everybody can read and comment on the Bible, this enhances the value of popular insights and undercuts traditional distinctions of rank in religious life. In other words, the priest becomes a little bit less necessary as a mediator if you can read the Bible for yourself. Again, Protestant Reformation. Um, equal access to the Bible can be a great leveler, as the experience of the Puritan Revolution in the 17th century England reminds us. Second, liberation theology emphasizes the Hebrew prophets, and in general, the Old Testament images of God as an active participant in the world. For prophets like Isaiah, Amos, Jeremiah, and also throughout the whole Exodus story, authentic faith, faith is most fully expressed in actions to promote justice. 
Liberation theology enhances prophetic roles, those by which teaching and example criticize injustice and work towards a better society. So the prophetic role of church and church leaders is very important. Uh, Max Weber talks about the role of the reformer and the role of the charismatic prophet. Liberation theology has also spurred reinterpretation of the impact of Jesus Christ, downplaying themes of passive suffering and sacrifice and highlighting instead Jesus' concern for justice, equity, and sharing. Also, there's a stress on the emphasis of doing theology in a way that prioritizes everyday experience and the insight of average people. The social centrality of core religious value of poverty undergirds a view which, according to poor people, have privileged a, a view according to which poor people have a privileged insight into reality. The poor are rich in faith. This hermeneutical position on poverty drives theology to enhance the value of ordinary experience to reflection and action. In this view, the poor have something of special value for theology and religion generally. Unlike much of modern theology, the basic interlo interlocutor, how do you pronounce that? In interlocutor of liberation theology is less the unbeliever than the poor. I found this to be an interesting distinction when I first read it. The basic problem is less atheism or secularism than idolatry and suffering. So one of the points that are made is that traditional European theology in recent uh, theology based in the United States is focused on an overarching problem of creeping secularism. And so the interlocutor of the those theologians and that theology is the unbeliever or the secular person trying to uh, do a um, apology of uh, the Christian faith for those who have lost faith in God. The problem in Latin America is not secularism. Most Latin American countries, with the exception of Uruguay, are not very secular. There are many of them, like Mexico and Colombia, are still very religious. And so, the uh, but they also have overwhelming levels of poverty that uh, are nearly unimaginable here in the United States. And so, the theology that arises out of Latin America is speaking to the poor and listening to the poor because the issue is not unbelief as much as it is poverty for average everyday Latin Americans. I thought that was an important distinction. Leonardo and Clodovis Boff are two liberation theologians from Brazil. They're brothers who, uh, I'm going to wait for that car to go by. Unfortunately, we live near the turnpike. Pretty soon there'll be an airplane go overhead as well. At least there's no dogs barking yet. Uh, the Boff brothers put it that to pretend to discuss liberation theology without seeing the poor is to miss the whole point, for one fails to see the central problem of the theology. So, these considerations add up to a method that is used, and the method in liberation theology um, moves from a deductive and axiomatic interpretive discipline, as it is the case with European theology, to an active commitment of listening to the poor and viewing the world through their eyes and experience. That's the starting point for liberation theology. Uh, commitment for the struggles for liberation are central. You can't be, you can't find some neutral place. from which you can uh, be a dispassionate observer. Another one is close and complex relations with Marxist theory. Some people affirm that you can po it's possible to use Marxist theory as a theoretical framework or a 
or a theory for analysis without being a Marxist in, in terms of being committed to revolution. That can be debatable, but as I shared earlier in this semester, we talked about Karl Marx and his theory as one approach of analyzing religion in Latin America. And this is the example where that comes closest to being the case, is in liberation theology. So a lot of liberation theology's basic sociological uh, theory is uh, borrowed from Marxism, which created a problem when it arose in 1969, 1970, 1971, basically at the height of the Cold War. So this placed liberation theologians immediately in opposition to the United States and to capitalism and to many of the, uh, the ruling regimes in Latin America. It arose about the same time as uh, categories like class conflict and exploitation were also becoming very prominent in Latin America. Uh, dependency theory was another uh, idea that arose around the same time as liberation theology. I also want to talk at some point about the ped pedagogy of the oppressed with Paulo Freire, which was another uh, uh, kind of uh, liberationist idea that arose almost simultaneously with liberation theology and dependency theory, which uh, in which education is, is it taken to be consciousness raising to help peasants and the poor and the illiterate to think critically about their life situation using the scriptures and learning how to read as they apply these lessons to their lives critically. Liberation theology also has other subtle links to Marxism. I'm going to skip over some of those for the sake of time. Liberation theology had a great stress on, on doing, on praxis, and on action to promote justice and re justice. Uh, and here Levine uh, quotes Marx's statement that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. That was Marx. Specific Marxist Christian alliances are the least significant part of the relation. There have been a, a couple of attempts for socialists or Marxists to uh, link up with Christian liberationists in Latin America. They haven't fared so well. Um, I believe one was in Chile in the 1960s. I believe it, we'll mention those later. Another one was, was in um, Colombia. And they didn't work out very well. Context and conjuncture. Liberation theology crystallized at a critical moment in modern Latin American history. And this is pretty important to understand it. So, in 1971, you have the first book on liberation theology, which came from Gustavo Gutierrez. That came shortly after the uh, Latin American bishops met for the second time. At Medi in Medellin, Colombia, 1968. This was after the Vatican II. They uh, coined a phrase at the 1968 meeting, uh, a preferential option for the poor. The 1970s were also witnessing a long slide into debt and economic depression. The rise of the rise of uh, base ecclesial communities, otherwise known as SEBs. Comunidades Ecclesiales de Basi. Uh, these were uh, basically grassroots ecclesial communities that arose within the Catholic Church in the 1970s. By the way, there was something similar happening in the United States with the Catholic Charismatic Movement at the same time. Political transformations in the 1960s and 70s. So first and foremost, you have the Cuban Revolution in 1959, which shook everything up in Latin America and also in the United States. In South America, this is this comes in the midst of the Cold War, and a couple years later you have the um, Cuban Missile Crisis, which certainly heated things up. So in South America you had military bureaucratic authoritarianism, dictatorships, military dictatorships in Brazil, Chile, Argentina, uh, there was an estimated 30,000 people that just disappeared in Argentina, not only tortured, but thrown out of airplanes over the ocean. Thousands dead or tortured in Chile, Brazil, and Uruguay. 
as well. This again was a national uh, national security doctrine, the idea that they had to stop Marxist uh, res uh, insurrection in their countries by stopping leftism of any kind, including college students, journalists, and so on. As we'll see in a moment, that was super important for the rise of uh, liberation theology because with that repression, political parties, and for example in Brazil in 1964, political parties were completely shut down, grassroots organizations were shut down, everything was basically shut down and controlled except for the Catholic Church. And uh, that means that you wanted to be an activist and you wanted to be in resistance to the dictatorship. The only place you could do that safely, relatively safely, was within the Catholic Church. And that's the context that in which liberation theology explodes. Uh, this continues uh, in the 1970s and into the 1980s in Central America with a successful revolution in Nicaragua. 1979, and also you, we had uh, Ray, the Reagan administration funding the Contras to destabilize the uh, Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and it also spilled over into El Salvador with a bloody and long civil war in El Salvador that nearly began with the assassination of Archbishop Romero which is a great film, but there's a great film with Raul Julia that illustrates a lot of the things we're talking about here. So, there's also a revolutionary transformation of significant ideas. Uh, there was a dependency theory in economics. In 1969, Cardozo and Falletto uh, published a, a, a game-changing book called Dependency and Development in Latin America. It's one I had to read for my master's program. Cardozo, by the way, eventually went on to become the president of Brazil. And, the, of course, the theory there here, here is that the, the Latin American countries or the countries in the third world only existed to be exploited for their natural, uh, natural resources. And by the uh, first world countries, Great Britain, Germany, United States, France, and that uh, tin and copper would be mined in Chile and Bolivia and shipped to the United States or Great Britain, where then it would be processed and value added into VCRs or radios or televisions and then sold back to Latin America. And, of course, in that exchange, the uh, value added high-tech stuff always goes up more in value than the, the uh, natural the commodities. Uh, copper and tin, and therefore the theory was that Latin America could never catch up because they were continually falling behind, selling bananas and buying TVs. You also had other political contexts. In 1969, you had the riots in Chicago at the Dem uh, Democratic National Convention, the Vietnam War, the assassination of Mar Martin Luther King Jr., Bobby Kennedy, uh, preceded... Uh, uh, succeeded a few years later by the deaths of Malcolm X. Camilo Torres was killed in 1964. He was a uh, worker priest sociologist in Colombia who was killed fighting against the government. And Che Guevara in 1967 in Bolivia. There was also the massacre of students. I think some 400 students massacred in the plaza of Tlatelolco in Mexico in 1968. So this was the context in which ideas of liberation and theology resonated strongly and the organizational innovations that inspired and legitimated found a ready and available audience, which in many ways simply did not exist before. There was, uh, there was also, um, well, I, I already mentioned this, that there was a agrarian proletarian I can't say that word proletarianization uh, farm work uh, farm workers became more and more uh, people living in the country and farming became workers basically it's a simple way to say that urbanization is that many of them because of violence in the countryside and because of lack of employment and poor conditions moved to the cities there was also the growth of literacy and mass communications and 
social bonds were loosened, which had been structured, which had structured daily life up to that point. And then you had this intense and expanded repression, especially in Argentina and Chile, which closed off all alternatives like political parties or trade unions. There was no outlet for political res expression or resistance. And this drove popular groups into the churches almost by default. The, the churches thus sought a new role and at the same time had one thrust upon them. Three issues in particular warrant separate attention, human rights, popular participation, and authority. Latin America and churches have been central to the promotion and defense of human rights in Latin America since the late late 1960s. In other words, this, this, this um, embrace of human rights by the Latin American Catholic churches began at the same time as liberation theology. And you'll see this when you watch the film Romero. He was not a Marxist. He was not even a liberation theologian. In fact, he was picked to be the Archbishop of El Salvador because they considered him conservative. However, he saw people being disappeared, being, their bodies being discovered in trash heaps, uh, people from his parishes, some of his friends who were priests were captured, tortured, and killed. This moved him to a stance of opposition to the government on the basis of human rights. So, Levine believes that the ideas of liberation theology played a key role in this process of legitimizing the discourse of pro-human rights, and he calls it a critical and prophetic role for the churches to uh, point these things out to society when there's abuse and uh, oppression happening. So as the popular classes came under attack, church leaders responded in their defense and thereby became entangled in broader political issues and confrontations. See the film Romero. Then uh, Levine goes on a discussion about the Sebs. The Sebs were these uh, small grassroots communities within the Catholic Church. They literally exploded in the 1960s. Originally, their motivation was religious because there were many places such as the backlands of Brazil where there just weren't enough priests. And uh, they needed to find a way to try to minister to the needs of the people pastorally. And so these little com communities within the parish became popular. This also happened in Protestantism with uh, Lutheranism, particularly in the 17th century. The little church within the church, Ecclesiola and the uh, Ecclesia, which was started, uh, which basically started the Pietist movement in Scandinavia in the 1700s. So Sebs generate new values, orientations, and forms of action which reach out from religion to revolutionize social and political life. And uh, here, uh, Levine takes a page, I think, in my opinion, from Max Weber and his study of uh, capitalism and Protestant work ethic, and also from Alexis de Tocqueville, who uh, studied, uh, he studied the uh, success of democracy in America and attributed a lot of the success to the... Uh, the effects that so many churches had on their adherence of creating a democratic ethos. In other words, in Baptist and Methodist churches that were springing up all over, all over the West in the 1830s, when uh, the Tocqueville was there, he studied how the involvement in your local congregation, in the case of Baptists, uh, voting in or voting out pastors, uh, created people who were confident in the democratic process and had democratic, had leadership that they could bring to, to bear in democracy. So Levine starts to study the effects of the ecclesial-based community and how it develops people from illiterate peasants into confident uh, leaders for democracy. And I'm going to skip over some of this. He points out that in Seb life, uh, there's a, the sub members meet regularly to, to read and discuss the Bible, to pray and to celebrate liturgies as a group. And this was absolutely non-existent in Catholicism before 
the 1960s. And again, it reminds us of some of the effects of Protestant Reformation and some of de Tocqueville's observations about churches and religion, religion in Latin America. Conservatives believe that the Seb were, Sebs were too autonomous, an unacceptable popular church located within and in opposition to traditional ecclesiastical leadership. And so jo Pope John Paul II and his key ally in Latin, in, in Latin America, Monsignor Alfonso Lopez Trujillo of Colombia, begin to take steps to try to close down or to resist the Sebs. And I've already mentioned... Uh, where Levine's analysis here takes a Weberian or Tuc Tocquevillian uh, direction because he's studying the, the habits of the heart. That's Robert Bella. The habits of the heart are the daily practice that shapes long-term trends and shapes character development in the members of the sets. And I'm going to skip over some of that for the sake of time. This is taking longer than I expected. So... Um, Again, he, there's some repetition here. In cases where Sebs became prominent, such as Central America, Chile, or Brazil, uh, the political sphere had been closed off against, and that drove people over into these alternative structures. And we come to the conclusion, and I, I'm going to skip down through here. Um, structures are of fundamental importance. They reinforce bonds of commitment and human solidarity so he begins to analyze the structures of the sebs and of course the sebs are one of the primary vehicles for liberation theology in a practical way among the everyday people and so uh he begins to to uh, enumerate some of the effects of the sebs and and the structures on liberation theology and he closes with the cases of chile brazil and I think, uh, yeah, those two cases. And uh, he saw that, a Brian, he cited Brian Smith as pointing out that the bishops fear for their authority within the church and strongly resisted attempts uh, to include class notions of class conflict and organizational autonomy in, in the substructures. This suggests difficulties for liberation theology to build long-term organization. In Brazil... Liberation theology's great concern with popular authenticity may unduly narrow and restrict its focus. And uh, radical pastoral agents often refuse to look beyond the grassroots level, arguing that only the people are authentic. And this hurts, according to Levine's view, this hurt the uh, institutional development of liberation theology. What of the future? First, if recent trends to civilian role, democracy, and political openness consolidate and spread. The centrality of religious groups and political organizations and action will fade. Uh, I read another book that we use in our uh, in our class uh, on contemporary Latin America by Sonia Alvarez, Engendering Democracy in Brazil. She found the exact same thing uh, in the case of women's, feminist and women's group organizations in Brazil. That during the uh, during the political crackdown and the military dictatorship, women's organizations and feminist organizations in Brazil just exploded as grassroots organizations. But as soon as the Brazil returned to democracy in the mid 1980s, these groups fractured, splintered, and lost their momentum. The same thing happened. Uh, the same thing w was likely to happen, according to Levine, with the movement. Of liberation theology. He, remember, he wrote this assessment in 1988. Brazil were, took the first steps back to democracy in 1985. So he was pointing ahead, but evidence since then has confirmed that he was right about that. So I'm going to stop here and uh, thank you for your time and attention. I hope you'll read his article. I didn't quite do it justice. There's a lot in there, but at least I gave you a quick overview. All right. Have a good week. I'll see you next week.